Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Aya Schumann. I will be your moderator today. I'm a member of the FDA stakeholder engagement staff within the Office of External Affairs. This call is brought to you by the FDA stakeholder engagement staff in partnership with the FDA's Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. As you just heard, this call is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the FDA's YouTube page. Today, we're joined by Dr. Janet Woodcock, Acting FDA Commissioner, and Dr. Peter Marks, Director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. All of our principals will provide opening remarks before we move into a question and answer session. I'd like to now direct you to the bottom of your screen. To ask a question live, please feel free to type it directly into the chat box, or you can also raise your hand via the participant tab, and we will call on you to ask your question. You could begin submitting your questions at any time. Please remember to include your name and affiliation as well so that we know which organization you represent. We may not be able to get to all questions today, but we'll try our very best to answer as many as possible. And with that, I'd like to now turn the call over to Acting FDA Commissioner, Dr. Janet Woodcock. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining. Um, as you know, earlier this week, the FDA took additional steps to expand the use of COVID-19 vaccines with boosters and uh, the CDC has followed. <clears throat> um, these actions reflect our ongoing commitment to public health um, to continue to try and address the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, while the pandemic uh, continues to impact the country, uh, vaccination <clears throat> continues to be the safest and most effective way to prevent COVID-19, including the most serious consequences such as hospitalization and death. Uh, although the number of COVID-19 cases, including hospitalizations and deaths, continues to trend downward um, in many parts of the country, um, doesn't mean we should stop being vigilant. As you know, that's not true in every part of the country and vaccination and public masking in high-risk settings continue to represent the best way to effectively put this pandemic behind us. Now to date, the currently available data suggests waning immunity in some populations of fully vaccinated people. And the availability of the authorized boosters is important for continued protection against COVID-19. The action we've taken this week help to address this waning immunity. <clears throat> As I said, um, they've been further discussed and evaluated um, by the CDC's uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices as well and uh, endorsed. So let me briefly walk you through our actions. First, the agency amended the Moderna COVID-19 Vaccine Emergency Use Authorization or EUA to allow for the use of a booster dose for eligible populations, including those 65 and older, those at high risk of COVID-19 due to various comorbidities, and those with frequent institutional or occupational exposure to the virus. And this would be at six months after the individual has completed the primary two-dose series. The agency also amended the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 EUA with a minor update to the booster authorization that we had already done uh, that aligned the language on institutional and occupational exposure to be similar to this week's Moderna authorization language. So those two are very much aligned. And then the agency has also amended the Janssen, also known as the J&J &J, uh, COVID-19 vaccine EUA to allow the use of a booster dose for individuals 18 years and older, two months after they receive their first dose or longer if they've gone longer than two months. Finally, the agency has authorized the use of all three authorized vaccine as a heterologous or so-called mix and match booster following vaccination with any available COVID-19 vaccine given as a primary series. And Dr. Marks will walk through the details of that decision, but that provides those of you in the front lines uh, more flexibility in trying to get everyone who's eligible boosted. The FDA's evaluation of all these EUA requests included a review of each manufacturer's trial data 
um, by our own scientific and medical experts and input from our advisory committee of independent scientific and, and medical experts. FDA recognizes that vaccines are one of our greatest tools in the fight against the pandemic and ensuring the availability of boosters uh, for those who need them is a very high priority. So thank you. And I will now turn to Dr. Marks to discuss more about the FDA process for approving the vaccines. Dr. Marks. So thanks very much, Dr. Woodcock. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today with you. Um, I'd like to focus my comments on uh, um, uh, something that I think people are interested in is our, our evaluation of the use of the uh, mix and match or heterologous uh, boosters um, uh, in the uh, FDA uh, authorized uh, COVID-19 vaccines. So the agency considered data submitted from a clinical trial sponsored by the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, our advisory committee's discussion of those data and our own evaluation of the available evidence. And based on the totality of the scientific evidence, um, we concluded that and determined that the known and potential benefits uh, of the use of a single heterologous booster dose of the eligible available vaccines outweighed the known and potential risks of their use in eligible populations. And uh, a single booster dose of any of the available COVID-19 vaccines may be administered as a booster dose following the completion of the primary vaccination with a different authorized or approved COVID-19 vaccine. And the eligible population and dosing interval for a heterologous booster dose or mix and match booster dose are the same as those uh, authorized for a booster dose of the vaccine used for primary vaccination. So just to give some examples here, for example, the um, uh, Janssen COVID-19 vaccine recipients uh, 18 years of age and older uh, can receive the single booster dose of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine, or they can get the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine or a half dose of the Materna COVID-19 vaccine at least two months after receiving their Janssen COVID-19 vaccine primary vaccination. Um, as another example, um, uh, for Moderna COVID-19 vaccine and Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine recipients falling into one of the eligible categories for boosters, including those 65 years in age and older, those 18 to 64 years of age at risk of severe COVID-19 or 18 to 64 years of age with frequent institutional or occupational exposure to sars coronavirus 2 they can receive a half dose of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine as a booster or a full dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, COVID-19 vaccine or the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine as boosters at least six months after completing their primary vaccinations. So, um, we recognize that healthcare providers and COVID-19 vaccine recipients will have questions about booster doses and the individual fact sheets for each of the vaccines provides relevant information for healthcare providers and vaccine recipients. And the agency is encouraging healthcare providers also to follow the recommendations provided by the CDC's advisory committee on immunization practices um, and formal recommendations signed by the CDC director. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, have all of this information detailed on our website, um, including both the fact sheets and uh, the details of our evaluation um, uh, so that people can see uh, the rationale for this. Um, uh, we feel that allowing for booster doses in populations that need them most at this time marks an important step in our collective efforts to bring uh, the COVID-19 pandemic to a close. Uh, and we really hope that working together uh, we will all succeed in that goal. Um, so now I'll turn the call back over to Aya. Thank you so much, Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Marks. As we enter into the question and answer segment of our event, if you haven't already done so, please type your questions into the chat box, or you can also use the raise hand feature on the call and we'll be sure to call on you. Please again, remember to state your name and organization as well. I'd like to first call on Dr. Shaw, Director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention and President of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials for our first question. Hey, thanks, Aya, and good afternoon, Dr. Woodcock. Good afternoon, Dr. Marks. Um, I just wanna take a minute to commend and, and applaud uh, FDA for the tremendous work over the past week, week and a half. I know there's more ahead, uh, but states are incredibly supportive of the recent moves, particularly around heterologous administration, which 
uh, for those you know, for groups that are out there vaccinating in the field, the ability and the need to only carry one vaccine when visiting, for example, a long-term care facility is a big step forward in our efficiency. So thank you on behalf of states uh, for, for this big step forward. Um, but almost as if on cue, we have started receiving questions about sort of the choose your own adventure approach to boosters. And uh, I, we've, we've been receiving them both from clinicians looking for guidance as well as from individual patients uh, trying to figure out what is the most optimum and best course for them. What, what advice do you have for them? And for example, are there, I, I know that CDC is working on a clinical considerations document, but to the extent that can be streamlined and simplified uh, to take into account some risk factors, what the first or primary series was, and what the ideal booster recommendation would be, that would go a long way from a communications front. Thank you very much again. Thank you. This is Janet Woodcock, and we recognize uh, that there will be people who, you know, can will probably obsess over what the best dose for them is now that they have a choice. Um, we, uh, I believe the CDC will be issuing some issue, um, some further clinical considerations. And I've encouraged flow charts to show, you know, how each of these, uh, you know, the examples Peter just went over, how you would do that. I think some of the only other considerations are best shared with health professionals, I would say, and Dr. Marks, you can uh, correct me if you think I'm, I'm going off uh, script here, but, you know, um, in general, people can get the same um, uh, immunization they got in the, in the first series if they are satisfied with that. Um, we do know that um, the, um, that the R mRNA vaccines, particularly maybe in the elderly, might be you know uh, a little bit more because they seem to be have uh, give a little bit more higher antibody levels. We actually aren't totally clear on how that relates to uh, resistance to infection. However, there seems to be some you know hints about that. Um, the uh, the mRNA vaccines appear in young men uh, to have a low but uh, detectable incidence of brief myocarditis following their administration. And of course, the thrombotic um, thrombocytopenic syndrome appears after the J&J vaccine appears to uh, be more prevalent in uh, younger women. So uh, if people are really want to parse through both benefits and, and side effects, I think those would be some of the relevant factors. Otherwise, these vaccines are all highly protective and we expect the boost of what, whichever one people get to also be highly protective. Dr. Marks, do you have further comments? Uh, no, I, 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 I'm kind of pragmatic with this one is that we just don't know what the best thing is here. And in some ways, maybe letting the cards fall where they make, where as they may, I think if, if you got a vaccine and it agreed with you right. <laughs> last time, I would get the same vaccine. I think some people will obsess about the fact that, um, you know, J and J, the titers don't look quite as high. But yeah. the fact is, it may turn out based on what we know about these adenoviral vectored vaccines that the long term immunity might turn out to be better with that right. vaccine. So we just don't know. Right. Um, and I think that barring having had some uh, uh, untoward side effect, um, or barring exactly the practical considerations that you noted. Yeah. That I, if you're in a nursing facility, I would much rather you get any booster. vaccine that, that, that's available as the booster right. than not get a booster. Um, so barring those kinds of things, I think it's, uh, it, it's really the, probably staying with your same <laughs> vaccine's fine. But as people, uh, as other folks uh, have asked, uh, the healthcare professionals say from the National Consumers League here, you know, the healthcare professionals will be asked the pharmacists and, um, and uh, physicians and nurse practitioners and so forth will be asked, you know, what is the best uh, vaccine for me and so forth. And I, I think that I agree that's the, the general um, first answer is they're all highly protective. 
Uh, but people may want to hear about, we know the side effect profiles are written in the fact sheets, they're described and so forth. And I think that's about as far as you can go. Excellent. Thank you so much. We have a question in the chat from Jeanette Contreras, Director of Health Policy at the National Consumers League. Jeanette? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the, um, the opportunity to ask questions. So this is going to be super confusing for consumers, right? You know, if I put the Janssen, it's two months. If it's the Pfizer, I have to wait six months. And then, you know, the mix and match um, option. Yeah, this is this is going to be, um, you know, I think a challenge for us to, to message. So what guidance or, you know, recommendation can you provide for us to help, you know, make sure consumers know, like, what is the clearest way to, to message this to consumers? You know, I think the most important thing is, are you should you get a booster right now? That's some of the most important messaging, because we want the people who are eligible to get a booster. I, I've noticed already um, the pharmacy chains uh, uh, and so forth are already having online questionnaires for people to fill out that will help them. You know, when did you get your last shot and so forth? Um, so I think that'll be very helpful because you still need to interact with a provider to get a booster shot. And so there will be the opportunity to avoid confusion by, um, by interaction with those providers. And a lot of them now are developing, you know, these flow charts or decision trees or whatever. So people can be walked through online as they make their appointment um, to, get a, to get a booster. Um, and as I said, the CDC will be trying to come out with some clinical considerations for, for the health professionals to, to evaluate, to um, have. But um, for, the, for the person in the street who's confused, I think the best um, guidance to them is probably refer them to the information that is posted on the web and also refer them to a trusted healthcare professional. Peter? I don't have anything to add, thanks. Thanks. Our next question comes from Meredith Yinger, Senior Regulatory Strategist from American Academy of Family Physicians. Meredith? Thanks so much for doing this call and also for taking my question. I think as we've already talked about extensively today, a lot of the onus for recommending which boosters patients should receive is going to fall on family physicians and other healthcare practitioners. And I think it's going to require extensive counseling on in certain situations for some patients, um, yes. which really kind of underlines the need perhaps for additional separate payment for that counseling. But I think my question for you all is, could you share how the FDA plans to monitor the safety and effectiveness of heterologous boosters, given the limited data we have thus far, and then how you're going to plan to share that information with physicians and other clinicians? Thanks again. Thanks. Yeah, I'll have Dr. Marks answer that question, but I will say the question, the question you raised about counseling and giving more time has already been, is being discussed. That's an important issue because some people are really going to have to be walked through this very carefully and it'll be time consuming. Dr. Marks. Yeah, no, thanks. So, so the, sa the safety here is clearly a very important thing. We, we are lucky in that even though it's not the identical situation, uh, in Europe, they have been using a similar vaccine to the uh, Janssen vaccine, that is the AstraZeneca vaccine, and boosting it with the Pfizer vaccine, and there are data published on that. The, the safety data are relatively encouraging there. Um, there are some additional data available already from uh, uh, pharmacovigilance systems in the Nordic countries, indicating that there don't seem to be any uh, issues when mixing and matching the uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines or mixing and matching those vaccines uh, with uh, one of the adenoviral vector vaccines. So that's, that's good news to start. But what's important here in the United States is that we have our safety surveillance systems, um, which will, uh, we will use to look at people who have received the various combinations of vaccines. Uh, it will take probably take uh, a number of weeks to a few months before there's enough data to actually make any kind of inferences from that. Um, but it's certainly something uh, that we'll be looking forward to looking at. 
um, not just even safety, but probably at a certain point, uh, we'll even be able to look at the effectiveness of these in real world, uh, uh, in real world settings. Yeah, and I think it's important to stress to all the primary care, it's important to report if you see a, uh, a an event and what you can tell patients is that we are, we're watching very closely and we're getting lots of reports and we're monitoring this situation. So it will be, it will be monitored very closely, but we really would, uh, it's really important for people to report if they observe any problems. I'd like to now turn to Katie Pischke, Senior Health Policy Associate from Adult Vaccine Access Coalition for our additional questions. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Marks and Dr. Woodcock uh, for being here today. Um, my question has to do with uh, if you all are, will be further examining other age groups uh, for the booster going forward. I know that 40 and above age group has been thrown around quite a bit. Um, and if you could talk a little to that and where we might be able to send our stakeholder groups who want to learn more about, you know, if and when they would be eligible for that booster. Dr. Marks, you might want to <clears throat> answer that one. Uh, so, so thanks very much. We have been following the data as it emerges very closely. Um, and there's additional data that we're going to have to go through um, in the not too distant future as well, because you may be aware that um, the Pfizer announced yesterday that they finished a study uh, looking at boosters um, in 10,000 individuals. It was a, a randomized controlled study. Um, and uh, it did seem to show that boosters did have a beneficial effect in preventing COVID-19 across the entire age spectrum. Now, there is a lot of debate about what the kind of COVID-19 is the most important uh, COVID-19 to prevent. And I would certainly agree, um, death or hospitalization is the most important thing. Um, but there are other benefits um, such as preventing uh, infection at all, uh, because uh, about uh, 10 to 15% of vaccinated individuals who get COVID-19 um, uh, in, in, in after being vaccinated, um, they end up with long COVID. And that's not a good thing, because that's what we're looking to prevent with vaccination in the first place, because it's very, uh, it actually drains medical resources um, at a time when we don't need to be draining them for this. Additionally, it can be very disruptive um, to the social structure if it takes people out of their jobs, particularly if it takes healthcare workers, um, food uh, processors, et cetera, from uh, what they need to be doing. Um, so we will be looking very closely at this. Um, we also think that this may be additionally, uh, uh, if we can get there um, to uh, get across the age range, it may be a simplification as well of things. Um, uh, but it will be based on data and those data are as I said, we have the Pfizer data, which uh, they, uh, my understanding is they will be submitted in the not too distant future, um, as well as additional data from Israel um, and other jurisdictions, which will uh, speak to uh, uh, the age range for boosters. But it's something we're watching. Um, we watch on a daily basis. <laughs> so thank you for the question. Our next question is from Maribel Ramo. Legislative Director for Health and Human Services at the National Governors Association. Maribel? Thank you. Thanks, Aya. Thank you, Dr. Marks and Dr. Woodcock and to FDA Intergov for quickly pulling this call together and all the actions you have taken thus far. Uh, just two quick questions for you. I know that um, there have been lots of questions about um, confusion. Obviously, that's um, something that we're really concerned about um, and for pro providers trying to explain to the public Dr. Woodcock, you had mentioned uh, flow charts that are in the works um, by CDC. Um, so we are awaiting those. Um, so this may not be necessarily a question for you both, but more feedback. Um, we're really looking for some kind of communication strategies for states, which would be very helpful. Um, if that's something that you all could take back, would definitely appreciate that. Um, in addition, can you talk a little bit about what additional training will be provided uh, to providers who are administering these vaccines and boosters? Dr. Marks, do you know? Um... Yeah, so, so my, my understanding is that CDC will be uh, trying to uh, do 
um, uh, some education. They are doing educational outreach. I know because I'm participating in uh, one of the IDSA CDC led calls, which usually has um, uh, uh, anywhere from hundreds to thousands of, of primary care and infectious disease doctors. It's, it's true, it's a global audience. Um, uh, we'll continue to do those outreaches. And I know that CDC has other outreaches um, there. I know they're putting together educational materials. They're putting together clinical considerations. So there'll be a variety of material, but um, we will bring back to the teens that how important this is um, uh, for, uh, for all. So what I, I get from this is state would like, uh, states might like to have ready-made talking points and, and things like that, educational materials that they can simply uh, disseminate <clears throat> rather than having to come up with those. Yeah. Yes, that would definitely be very helpful. Appreciate yeah. it. Sure. Um, our next question actually comes from uh, by email. Can you talk about the decision to authorize a half dose of Moderna for mix and match? when the NIH study looked at a full dose for a booster? Sure, I'll have Dr. Marks answer yeah, that. Yeah, so, so this is, this is a, a, it's, it's a good question. And, and it, it's one that's, uh, we, we, I think it, it's understandable this way. There were multiple lines of evidence that led us to conclude that the 50 microgram dose of, of the Moderna was very reasonable to use in this setting. Um, first of all, uh, the 50 microgram dose of Moderna uh, creates an immune response um, that is at, at day 29, which is when we, the, 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 these data were looked at, uh, it's about 75 plus a little bit percent of the response with a 100 microgram dose. So the immune response are kind of of the same order of magnitude. And it turns out that by day 57, uh, the immune responses are nearly identical. So from an immune response perspective, um, good, you know, the 50 and the 100 in, are, are quite similar. Um, and then from the standpoint of the, what was observed with the, the, the Moderna vaccine given to Janssen and Pfizer recipients at hundred micrograms, they had very, it's almost exuberant booster responses, you know, 75 fold increases in titer, 20 fold increases in titer. Um, those are quite remarkable. So there's that, that is, that is uh, plenty of room to move, even if it was not quite uh, to the same extent. And operationally, having, if, if, if it's confusing, we're talking about confusion now, <laughs> if we had to have two different booster doses of the Moderna vaccine, one for those who had a Janssen or a Pfizer before, and one for ha those who had a Moderna before, that would be very, very challenging. And it would make the life of, um, uh, as you go through that nursing facility, even it, it, would, it would create confusion and chaos. So it, because the immune response is close enough, um, and we will actually have confirmation of this because the NIH is doing a study now with 50 micrograms, which will be available shortly, uh, we felt very comfortable making this, um, uh, making this decision. Excellent. Um, another question received via email, how long will boosters provide protection? Are we going to need boosters every six months or every year? It's a good question. I wish we knew the answer. Dr. Marks, you want to Yeah, elaborate? you know, we, we, don't, we don't know the answer. We, we do have, I, I, I know speaking to the best immunologists, um, the thought is that the third dose will probably provide us with a longer duration of protection. Mm -hmm much the same way as the third dose of a hepatitis vaccine um, or a six month dose of a zoster vaccine provides you with more durable immunity uh, than, uh, than if you had just had one dose um, or earlier doses. Uh, but we don't know how long that will last. And for that matter, we don't know with this virus, um, you know, it, 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 speaking about very long-term immunity, like years and years, like we think about a tetanus shot, may not be really an appropriate thing with this virus because this virus is not like um, the things that we're, we often think of um, where the, uh, for instance, zoster or other things where you don't have to worry about shifts here. This is probably gonna be something that if we are not lucky enough uh, to see this come under control, and it may be the case, we may have to start thinking about that. We may see it evolve such that much like influenza, 
we may need a booster shot once a year. We don't know that for a fact now. We don't, and I really hope that's not the case, um, but it's something that uh, could become uh, something that becomes a reality. I'm just trying to just tell you the possibilities, even though, believe me, I hope uh, there's nothing more than I'd hope that everyone finally wakes up, smells the coffee, goes out and get vaccinated. We get to 90% of people in the country um, uh, vaccinated and we have herd immunity and this thing uh, it goes away uh, with only very small sporadic outbreaks. But um, um, there, the, the, the scenario that is uh, probably most likely now is that we may be having this virus around with us for a bit. And so we may be in for getting boosters, whether it be yearly or somewhat longer, we just don't know yet. Our next question, what should we tell our stakeholders who receive the Janssen vaccine and want to get a booster, but may be concerned about TTS? Marks. Yeah, I'm happy to, you know, I, I think that's, this is, this is one where if somebody raises the concern, I probably, I think this is a good provider uh, uh, patient discussion. Um, I think there's, it's because of the, we're, we're not, we don't have a recommendation for preferring one over the other. Um, if, if a patient had a real concern, I don't think there's any reason why they should be discouraged from getting uh, uh, another booster vaccine, uh, booster um, at, at the appropriate time interval. Um, uh, and I think considerations that would go into that um, was whether this was a man or a woman, and whether if it was a woman, it was a woman who was under the age of 50, because that's where if you were um, uh, talking to someone, that would be where the risk group would be highest. But again, I, I think because we're not, we're not making preferences here, um, uh, I wouldn't you know, I, I, it, it, there's no reason to, to, to I, would, I would think we have to say to someone, oh, you really need to stick with your Janssen. If they have concerns, it's reasonable for them yeah. to. We think, uh, yeah. yeah, we think it's more important that somebody gets a booster, booster. if they're concerned exactly. about their original, original vaccine, then they have a choice now. We have flexibility and get them a booster. Don't, you know, tell them they have to have the same thing they, they got. Thank you. We have another question from Jeanette from NPL. Jeanette? Yeah, hi again. So um, going back to the conversation that, that um, Dr. Marks, you were talking about how if this doesn't go away and people don't get um, the vaccines, you know, we're still going to be really concerned about our immunocompromised um, individuals, right? Including children under age five who will not be eligible for vaccines right away. So I think we're going to be in this situation where, um, you know, we have to be concerned about people with underlying health conditions. And so this is another population we need to try to, to message to and reach to. Um, do you have any insight into how we're going to, you know, talk about this? Is this again, where we just have folks talk to their physician? So, and, and, and this is, so I think, uh, this is one of those cases where it, there will be probably some need for people to um, to have those conversations with their healthcare provider. But um, you know, and I think that's why Dr. Woodcock was saying that there was there was some discussion about how to try to uh, have the appropriate compensation, the appropriate uh, ability to 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 allow those con uh, conversations to be facilitated. Um, are there? Can I? How is there a specific? Can I try to get to specific issues for you? Yeah, we we're just trying to figure out like, how do we explain to consumers, you know, this is still a threat. You know, we, everybody needs to get a booster vaccine, but not everybody is yet eligible and people who are immunocompromised are at greater risk of severe disease from COVID. Well, I mean, I think in terms of a, in terms of a more general, I think what, what we, what we can see is that I mean, I think in, in, the, in the broader scheme of things, we are seeing that there is declining protection with these vaccines over time, um, that we want to keep people protected uh, so that they don't become susceptible to um, uh, uh, infection or particularly to severe infection. And that the risk groups that we're talking about, particularly people over 65, um, the reason for targeting those individuals with boosters is because we can see from uh, evidence uh, from 
Israeli data, as well as uh, 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 some of the evidence that's uh, uh, starting to emerge in the United States, that those are the people who are most likely to end up with severe COVID-19 uh, in the highest numbers. Uh, it's interesting that you can see the breakthrough infections throughout the age ranges in the data from various countries, uh, but it's a matter of who gets the sickest. And so uh, the, the risk groups here, so, so recommending boosters for the highest risk groups here does seem to make the most sense right now because those are the people who would be most at risk um, uh, for getting severe COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like many other things, uh, communication issues, uh, different people receive messages different ways. We need to have many different communication channels and many different messages. But the bottom line is you have an underlying health condition. You ought to have a booster because you're at risk. And if you're immunocompromised, of course, we've been encouraging those people to get boosters for some time now. So um, uh, I think uh, the problem is the anti-vaccine sentiment and this um, suspicion and all the different things that are going on. We're still having a lot of people dying. Many of them are in these at-risk groups, and yet they haven't even had their primary series. So I think National Consumer League and everyone else is all of us need to just try to get the message out that um, there are people at high risk. <clears throat> Vaccination is their best bet. Um, one of the um, messages that we've been encountering, the wrong messages, <laughs> is that, oh, well, there are all these treatments, so you don't need to get vaccinated. And, you know, we have a lot of people dying who've tried all kinds of um, remedies that are recommended um, uh, uh, in social media and so forth. So I think we just, every group that uh, united, the states, the consumer organizations, everybody, we just have to keep hammering on this message. I, I'd just like to chime in there that, that the other thing that's important, I think, as a messaging with boosters is the fact that boosters are necessary should not in any way discourage anyone <laughs> from getting these vaccines up front. Right. Um, that's that's one of the real concerns I have, that this is this doesn't mean that the vaccines don't work. It's just the, the nature of the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Mark. We'll take one last question from Katie Pischke from the chat. Katie? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I had a question about how pregnant people will factor into this guidance. Um, would they be considered amongst that higher risk group as outlined by the booster recommendations? Um, and if not, could you please explain? Dr. Marks? Yeah, so pregnant women, pregnant women are considered at higher risk. Um, uh, we, the, the outcomes of COVID-19 in pregnant women are, yeah. uh, are clearly not good. And that's why um, uh, major uh, professional societies have come out and said that the benefits outweigh the risk of COVID vaccine during any, originally we were very cautious about first trimester. Now, basically um, during any trimester of pregnancy, uh, one uh, should feel uh, free to go ahead and get vaccinated against COVID-19. And so, uh, and, and for that matter, if a woman is in the situation that she needs a booster, um, uh, she should consider herself at high risk in, in a high risk group and uh, would get a booster vaccine. We've reached the end of our call. I'd like to give Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Marks a chance to make any closing remarks. Well, I thank everyone very much uh, for the opportunity to talk to you and your really important questions. We will try to really pay as much attention as possible to provide re uh, informational resources that are usable in this situation because our mutual goal is to get as many people uh, who need it boosted as possible to get this under control. Dr. Marks? I'll just echo Dr. Woodcox, but also uh, say thank you for what you're doing all the yeah. time. Uh, we know at the front lines is not easy and we're very grateful um, for everything that you do. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. The FDA stakeholder engagement team is available if you have any questions. If so, please feel free to email us at FDA stakeholder engagement at fda.hhs.gov. We hope to speak with you again soon.